Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Welcome to another edition of Your Take. I'm your host, James Ewan. Thank you for watching the channel and don't forget to subscribe. See all our interviews with our guests, talking about their lives and their careers, all from their perspective. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by someone you may have seen on your television. My guest is a radio and television broadcaster, best known for specializing in natural history and archaeological programs. She's also a qualified diver, presenting programs on marine and underwater life. Before venturing into the world of filmmaking, my guest studied zoology at Bristol University. She also gained further experience about wildlife filming for her early work experience with the BBC Natural History Unit. From working as a researcher with the BBC and other production companies, her first presenting role was on Fox Television's World Gone Wild in 1999. Since that opportunity, my guest has not looked back, and now has a long list of programmes she's presented and worked on. Channel 4's Rep Detectives, the BBC Two series Hidden Treasure, the popular series Coast, and a regular reporter for The One Show. My guest has also presented The Breakfast Programme for BBC Radio Free, a writer for Diver Magazine, a presenter for the Radio 4 show, Tweet of the Day, an accomplished musician. From our brief conversations in a village shop, I now talk to Miranda Kristofniakoff about life, family, broadcasting, wildlife, nature, and her story. A uh, very warm welcome, Miranda. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for that introduction. That was great. <laughs> Thanks for, for joining me today on, on your take. We're obviously going to speak about your story and the journey to, to get to that position. But before we talk about those endeavours and what we've mentioned during the introduction, can we rewind the clock and go back to the, the very beginnings? You were born Miranda Harper Jones on January the 29th in 1973 in the county of Buckinghamshire. Can I ask what your recollections are of your childhood? And can you tell us which part of Buckinghamshire you grew up in? Yeah, so I grew up just north of Slough. Um, it's quite a leafy home counties area, very close to Burnham Beaches, which is this beautiful beach, ancient beach woodland, where I spent a lot of my childhood walking barefoot amongst the beech trees. I still have a bit of a passion for beech trees. Every time I see a copper beech or a beech, they, they sort of remind me of that early childhood. And I had, you know, a pretty sort of standard upbringing. Um, I was very lucky. We had a very nice house with a nice garden. And so I spent a lot of time outside. Um, my dad was um, amazing, sort of he, in, in sort of inventor, tinkerer, sort of engineer -y sort of guy. And um, he made me a death slide that's like a zip wire thing that came across the garden. We had this big old copper beech tree that I used to sit in. And uh, at first I had a rope ladder that went up and down um, and then he made me the zip wire that went across the garden. And so that was really fun. I just, you know, I just remember that's the, the thing about my childhood that really stands out is sort of, you know, crossing the garden with, uh, on the zip wire. So, yeah, lots of time outside. Um, I went to school in Reading um, to a pretty sort of standard girls school there. But it was a bit, it was a bit uh restrictive in places but I had a I had a pretty happy childhood and um all along loved being outside loved being with animals thought I wanted to be a vet for a while uh because I just always had animals you know around the house it was cages of animals and other people's animals that I'd look after um but yeah, I fell in love with the natural world and with biology and had an amazing biology teacher at school. And that's what led me to come to Bristol and study zoology. We'll come on to the academia part shortly. 
You've spoken about your love for the the outdoors. You've spoken very much about this idyllic childhood. Yeah. I want to talk a bit more about your parents. Who were they? What did they do for a living? And do you have siblings as well? Yeah, so uh, my mum uh, worked as a secretary. Uh, she spent a lot of time at home bringing us up when we were kids. Um and then started to work a bit more part-time when we got older. Um, and my dad was an engineer, um, ran his own company for a little while, um, had some great ideas about making car immobilizers. Uh, he, he invented a car immobilizer that could be used on a classic car. I remember many summers sitting there with a soldering iron making these tiny little car immobilizers. Um, so uh, yeah, and then I've got a brother who is uh, just a bit older than me who uh, was sadly away at boarding school for much of my uh, sort of teenage years. And uh, he currently lives abroad with his family in Tajikistan. Uh, so we don't necessarily see a lot of him, although he's over here at the moment because um, his two boys are at university in the UK. Uh, so that's it. You know, it's nothing particularly remarkable about my childhood. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's pretty standard, really. From your early years, we now come on to schooling. You went to Abbey School in Reading from the years 1984 to 91. Do you have happy memories from your school years? And what subjects were your favourites and why? And did you have any career aspirations, even from that sort of very young age? Yeah, so um, I was always interested in sciences. Uh, so uh, yeah, just there was always a love for biology and the natural world. Um, so and I and I had this amazing biology teacher who was really inspirational to me, and definitely was the reason why I came to Bristol to study zoology. Um, I do. I think the school was was okay. It wasn't particularly remarkable. It is now. I've been back since, and it is the most amazing, buzzy place. Um, but I think back then, I just sort of. You know, I just, I don't know, I, I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. I was happy there, but I haven't got any friends that uh, sort of long lasting friends that I stayed in touch with from those school days. Um, I think it was only really at university that I started to form, you know, really, really close relationships with people. Um, so, so yeah, pretty, pretty unremarkable, really. Um, I think it would have been nicer to have been somewhere a bit more dynamic and exciting. And I do think a girls school can have its limitations and I've you know if I had my time again I probably definitely would for sixth form I would have gone to a mixed school um but it was good it was a I had, had an amazing education and say the one the one thing that I look back with um sort of fondness really is this unbelievable uh biology teacher who sadly died of cancer um but I was I managed to go back to the school to give an inaugural lecture in her memory um, and just have a, an opportunity to thank her and her family for this amazing sort of enthusiasm and inspiration about biology and the natural world. And after going through lots of different decisions about wanting to be a vet and then thinking about being a doctor and doing medicine, I decided that what I really, really wanted to do was just do a very general biology course that then specialised in zoology um, and then just go in that direction and see where that took me. I didn't really know when I left school what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to work in conservation, maybe. But I sort of thought, I, I don't I don't really know. I'm just going to do the subject that I really love and see where it takes me. From an inspiring figure that you've spoken about, let's come on now to your time in Bristol because it's played an important role as the place you live and the place you now work. What made you decide to reside in, in Bristol and study zoology at the University of Bristol? And... Can you share with us your experiences from your university tenure? Uh, what did you learn from the degree? And were there any lecturers or peers who made a, a big impression during your time there? Well, Bristol University made uh, an, an amazing initial impression on me. Um, I actually applied to go to Cambridge because my dad and my brother had been to Cambridge and then decided after going to Cambridge, I didn't really want to go there. Uh, so and that that stirred up the situation a little bit at school. My 
uh, head teacher wasn't very happy about that. But I arrived at Bristol and I remember it. It was a it, it was a typical Bristol day, actually. You know how much it rains in the city. Um, so it was raining. And um, I just remember it raining and walking up a lot of hills, which is pretty much Bristol in a nutshell, isn't it? But I remember setting foot in the biology department and it was so welcoming. And uh, the lecturers were really engaging and the students that we met there on that open day were just brilliant. And I, I just, I could imagine myself at that place learning in that environment. And uh, that was it. I didn't really want to look anywhere else. I did, but um, so yeah, hence applying here, getting the place here, doing the university degree here and absolutely loving it from start to finish. It was brilliant. I had a whole bunch of incredible lecturers. I had the most amazing tutor. So after having this incredibly inspirational biology teacher, the next key figure in my life was my tutor at university who sadly lives in Australia now. Um, but he was he was really key in sort of helping me find where I wanted to go in life and arranging some work experience and things like that at the BBC for me. Um, but the other key thing about Bristol, I think, was the I did a lot of music at the university. I was really lucky that even though I wasn't studying music, I got involved in a whole load of orchestras and choirs and ensembles and productions and things like that. And so if I look at the friends, the close friends that I have now from my time at university, the vast majority of those people are through some of the musical uh, activities that I did at the university. Uh, and still now I have contacts with with the music here at Bristol. And it's it's I mean, Bristol is, is a city of eclectic music anyway, but the university was very strong in the music department and that I loved. And that was yeah, really it gave me lots and lots of opportunities to do so I'd never done before. Um, and also gave me the opportunity to learn to scuba dive as well. I joined the university scuba diving club. It's about 10 pounds or something for the year. And somebody was going to teach me to scuba dive and explore this amazing underwater world, which is now, you know, it's where I call home, really. So I look back really fondly at my time at Bristol and um, it was epic and definitely you know that's that's you know shaped the course of my uh whole life uh by coming to here to this city i think we'll stick on this musical theme because it's made a huge impression in your life and as you've mentioned you were actively involved in playing and performing at your time at university but what age did you discover music and you became interested in playing and performing and can you talk about some of the musical influences that were played growing up in the family household and discovery of music off your own off your own accord as well? So, um, yeah, my parents were both. Well, my mum was a singer, actually, for a while. She did a lot of local shows and things like that and concerts. And um, my dad, even though he wasn't a musician, he we always had Radio 3 on in the background. Classic FM didn't exist back in those days. Uh, so both my brother and I were encouraged to learn to play musical instruments. And um, I picked up the flute at a time when James Galway was the guy, you know, and he was just everywhere. And he was an amazing influence. I remember going to hear him in concert and it was just phenomenal. But not just him. I, then after seeing him play, I would go and see other um, particularly flautists uh, and be really inspired by what they were playing and the way they played it. And I remember going to a concert and there was this incredible flautist who, instead of standing in the middle of the concert hall, it was actually in a church, you know, behind a music stand, he perched, sort of, he sat on the pulpit with his legs dangling over the side and played this, he was playing a little sort of cheeky little, um, like a nymph song or something like that. And things like that made a massive impression on me. I was like, wow, I'd love to do that. That would be really cool. And <clears throat> I was able to go to the proms. So we saw, and, and we, you know, we didn't live that far from London. So there was a lot of, um, we, we were involved in a lot of concerts and things like that, either playing or listening. I also was lucky enough to have an incredible music school. So like a county music school, and they happen all over the country, but the one that I went to in High Wycombe was really, really strong. Again, amazing teachers. Thank goodness for incredible music teachers. Uh, the guy who ran it was amazing. I had a brilliant piano teacher, brilliant bassoon teacher. The guy who was running the orchestras and the bands was really inspirational. So I had a really good um, 
again, quite a wide range of musical education uh, early on, which is fantastic. Um, lots of opportunities, a few competitions, you know, occasionally won something, which gives you a bit of a boost. And so, um, yeah, so it was a really big part of my growing up was music. And I, oh, there was also this lovely lady who lived around the corner from me and she ran a little monthly music club. It was a bit old fashioned, a bit Victorian really. And every month people would turn up and play the piece that they'd been playing, you know, practicing that month. And it was, I was probably the youngest person there and it ranged in, hugely in age and in um, ability. But this lovely, lovely old dear old lady, she was she became my accompanist and she was just, again, really, really inspirational. And it's wonderful when people sort of take young people under their wing and just, you know, they benefit from the wealth of experience and knowledge from that particular person. But it's lovely to have mentors like that. And yeah, she was she was really, really important to me, as was my amazing flute teacher. Um, so many influences around me that. You don't realise at the time how valuable they are, but you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for all that time and energy that you invested in me. Lots of influences and mentors in your life. And there seems no question that you made the best of your opportunities at university. It was um, an impressionable time for you. I want to pick up on two other things is that you started working at Slimbridge Nature Reserve and you discovered your love for filmmaking after a three month placement at the BBC's Natural History Unit. Can we talk about that period and what opportunities did these experiences create and what aspects of the filmmaking process particularly interested you and why did you want to pursue a career in that particular area? So as I mentioned earlier, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do for a career when I started at university. So I started on this very wide course about biology and then this amazing tutor who I talked about uh, sort of sat me down. It's like, you know, what do you want to do? I quite like to work in conservation. So he suggested that um, it was a good idea to, to volunteer at somewhere like Slimbridge. So I just applied. It's only up the road. Um, and it was just the most inspirational place to work. I mean, set up by Sir Peter Scott. Um, and, you know, there are centres all over the country and they do a huge amount of amazing conservation work. Um, and uh, so I spent, yeah, three months there just volunteering with a warden. Um, so mucking out birds, feeding birds, talking to the general public about birds. Um, and I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I thought, yes, this is really, this is practical conservation, but engagement with the public as well. Really, really enjoyed that. And then... So that was in the summer of my first year at university. And then things sort of progressed. And, the, you know, my tutor said, you know, what, what, you know, is that really what you want to do? Or, you know, are there other things that you'd like to sort of explore? And so we started talking about the BBC because obviously the Natural History Unit's here in Bristol. And um, I was like, probably a bit typical student. He's like, oh, I quite like to work in telly, um, as so many people say. And he managed to arrange some work experience with this incredible cameraman. I mean, I was looking at the credits of the David Attenborough Wild Isles recently. His name's on that on that show. Uh, an absolutely amazing guy who, again, took me under his wing, looked after me, introduced me to lots of people at the BBC. Every question that I had, he would answer. So I knew nothing about filming. I knew a lot about wildlife. I knew nothing about filming. I didn't know what film was and tape was and 35 mil and 16 mil and editing and all of that sort of thing. Sound recording, um, dubbing, all of that sort of stuff. I had no idea, but I wanted to learn. And it was really exciting. He had a... Um, a studio in the middle of Bristol and we set up lots of different film sets to film different animals and we go out on location and I would just be holding stuff and watching and asking questions and making tea but it was this incredible world that was so exciting and every every day was different and I was learning so much and I thought wow this is what I want to do for a living this is just brilliant this is bringing exciting stories about wildlife to people and, and trying to present them in a really innovative and unusual way, looking for story, really clever, neat stories about amazing animals and amazing people working with amazing animals as well. And it just seemed to be the best thing ever. So I, um, yeah, had got after that work experience, did a bit more and then managed to get a job as a runner um, right at the end of my third year. And then sort of, you know, 
managed to end up working at the, the natural history unit. So I started off there working as a researcher. The presenting came a bit later, um, but I managed to secure a job just after leaving university. And that was, yeah, again, the beginning of, of my career there, really. And just amazing. So lucky. You've spoken a lot about the, the learning process and taking advice from people, again, who were influencers and mentors and showing you the ropes. Can we come on to the next chapter? And that's how you got your break into television presenting when in 1998, you worked for Fox Television on the programme World Gone Wild. How did you feel about presenting in front of the camera? Did you have any training or was it a case of literally learning on the job? Oh, very much so. There is no training. There's no presenters training school that you go to. So that all happened again sort of purely incidentally really so I was working as a researcher and there's a natural progression that you work for, you for me from researcher to assistant producer um and then to producer or sort of directing as well it's a um it's not quite like the the, the rest of the film world the, the the natural history world but um so I was actually I went on a course to be a director um, and I was quite interested in directing uh, presenters. So the course was meant to work with, we had a few like guinea pig presenters for the day. So like, I think we were like meant to be four guinea pig presenters who turned up and, and, and there were maybe a group of 16 of us working with those people. Anyway, we turned up to the course and only three presenters turned up. And the guy who was running the course said, well, does anybody want to be a presenter for the day? Because we need another one. And I looked around the room and nobody was putting their hand up. And I was like, well, I'll do that. That sounds like fun. So, I mean, that literally was the turning point in my career. So I ended up presenting for the day, never done anything like it before. Didn't know what I was doing at all. I've got lines to, to learn. I've got to walk and talk and hold an animal at the same time. <laughs> oh my God, it's just a brain explosion. And at the end of the day, we looked through the footage and we got feedback, obviously, from the guy who was running the course. And he was like, well, have you ever thought about TV presenting? <laughs> No, never thought about it for a moment. I said, well, it was quite good, actually. You know, you wave your arms around a lot. I still do. That's just me. Um, you know, and you've got a long way to go and you need to get some more experience doing this and, and do that a bit less and all that sort of thing. But he said, but, you know, the, the initial sort of stuff is is there and it was like wow I remember coming home that night going oh my god maybe I could do this this would be really exciting so then you think right how am I going to do this so you know you email the shopping channels and all the kids tv and just any opportunity to try and get experience because you can't you need a show reel to get a job um, and you can't get a show reel without having a job. So this is real chicken and egg situation. So I got friends of mine to sort of direct me doing silly things, you know, whether I'd be cooking in the kitchen or I don't know, just holding my hamster sort of thing, talking about it. And then I was um, a, a round robin email came around. I found a copy of it the other day. So, you know, it was Fox Television and TVNZ, so TV New Zealand collaborating on a big international project all about conservation they were looking for a whole load of bright-eyed bushy-tailed completely inexperienced young uh presenters internationally so there were people all around the globe working on this series um and uh i just remember sort of sending a little tape of me holding a garter snake talking about it in a friend's front room and then it all went really, really quiet. And then I got this random phone call saying, OK, right, um, we are going to make a pilot for this show. And could you go to South Africa for four days uh, like next week? <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. Yes, probably I can. I think I can. So, yeah, literally flew out to South Africa, talked, to, uh, did a film about Black Rhino, uh, flew back again. Um, and it was all a bit of a whirlwind. Didn't really know what was going on. And then, then the, the initial job came in to work on this series. And it was, I mean, I could talk for hours about this. Oh my God, what a learning curve it was. So I had no agent. So I had no uh, idea about contracts and conditions and things like that. So the money they were offering was just unbelievable for what they wanted. And they wanted me to sign in as for a six year exclusive deal with them. And I just thought, God, this is just so wrong, isn't it? I just, this. so anyway, my husband stepped in and and sort of you know tried to get a bit more money and tried to get the the exclusivity deal down but they wouldn't budge on certain things and so but it's like this is my you know this might be my one hit wonder I've got to sign 
and you know do it so I did um and had a very exciting summer of you know I went to uh Florida and South America and filmed so many different animals and and did some diving as well I'd never dived and presented before my god that was weird um totally thrown in the deep end pardon the pun but I just literally I didn't know what to do again I had a lovely director who was really very generous and kind with her time and um you know just gave me lots and lots of advice and tips on what to do and what not to do um so I bumbled my way through all of that and yeah then I, then that gave me this magical show reel so I then had a tape of stuff that I could actually send to people so look at me this is what I do I want a job as a wildlife presenter so the rest is history really the rest is history. You mentioned the words, this could be a one hit wonder, but it certainly wasn't because you go on to create further opportunities for yourself and work on so many different programs. And we can mention so many Water Warriors, The Children's Show Smile, Wreck Detectives, Hidden Treasure and Time Trail. However, you were probably brought to the greater public attention for your work on Coast. And as a regular reporter on the one show, why do you think those two programs raised your public profile? So Coast was a bit groundbreaking when we look back at it. Before Coast, we didn't have programs uh, that were sort of multi-genre. So if you watched a show, it was a history program or a cooking program or a program on social economic issues or whatever. You knew what you were tuning in for. To. And I remember when we were having the initial meetings about Coast and we were putting this show together and um, somebody, some critic or, or somebody at the BBC maybe said, this is this is not going to work because people are not going to know what they're tuning into. You know, you've got history and then you've got biology and then you've got archaeology and it's this mismatch, mismatch of, 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 of genres and people are going to get very, very confused. Um, but actually, it was it was I say it was groundbreaking because it was the first series in the UK to really take all of these different um, sort of threads, all presented by different experts. So everybody was credible in their own right um, with an anchor, and and it really really worked. And it was you know, and now you know we have loads and loads of shows like that, and also the sort of travel element of it as well. We're taking you on a journey. Here we are from start to finish. We, this is the little bit of coastline that we're going to look at this week, and you know, in this journey around this section of coastline, we're going to bring in you know, yeah, say history, archaeology, politics, all sorts of things. So um, that was it. Was amazing to be involved in that. It was really. It was it's such a hit, you know, we we won BAFTA for it. It was one of those shows that just, it's, oh, and it's endlessly repeated as well. If only I got repeat fees, I'd be well retired by now. Um, and we went on to make series after series. And we did, um, did we do 10 series in 10 years of Coast as well? And then it went to Australia. Not We didn't, but it did. Um, and then there were all sorts of spin-offs and we had a, a coast road show in the first or second year as well. And we went around the country doing talks and like festivals and all about coast. So it was amazing looking back. It was such a such an incredible opportunity. Um, and we all got to know each other really well as presenters as well. So that was really lovely. And then I think because I did coast that gave me the opportunity to get work on the one show as well, which, again, is uh, it's really different. Um, you know, it is a magazine show, and I know we've had those around for, for decades, but the one show sort of reinvented the whole magazine show um, idea. And again, lots and lots of experts, lots of really quirky, unusual individuals presenting stories from all around the country. Um, and it was really fun. And I think a lot of the stories that we did for the one show or we do for the one show, you, you'd never watch an, an hour's documentary on um, I don't know, robotic ants or bee flight or puffins, but you would watch five minutes, four minutes, five minutes, which is what, how long those sex segments are. And so it, we could introduce a lot of stories that were, were quirky and short and sweet, but would never sustain a whole documentary, but would make a really neat, crazy, often um, piece for the one show. So I think it's really struck a chord 
with people. Um, and again, you didn't know what you were going to get. You turn on, you know, seven o'clock. You have no idea what, I mean, half the time we had no idea what was going to go on the show as well when things would be changed at the last minute live. Um, but you, yeah, you didn't know what you were going to get, but everything you got was really interesting. So um, I feel very privileged that I've worked on both of those two and say that really brought me to uh yeah hopefully the attention of the of the public um and it, it gave me a voice for uh bringing natural history to an audience who maybe wouldn't be turning on to David Attenborough um but they would be turning on to the one show and coast we're going to sidetrack a little bit in the the narrative and talk about scuba diving because you've touched upon it briefly and you learned to scuba, ta- scuba dive at your time at university, but it's also played a major part in your career, having travelled and dived all around the world. Miranda, what fascinates you in exploring marine wildlife? And can you talk about some of the interesting places you've dived and the marine life you've seen and studied? So, yeah, scuba diving was awesome. It was one of those things that I just... You know, you're freshers week at university, you have this opportunity to, to join lots of different clubs and societies. And I remember just sort of sitting there going, oh, what do I fancy? And so I did hot air ballooning. Well, so I literally have been up on a hot air balloon once at university. Um, but the scuba diving was like, yeah, that looks yeah, that's quite fun. And there was a rather an attractive guy in the queue in front of me who I got chatting to. So uh, that was that sort of, yeah, <laughs> drew me in in that direction. Um, and we spent uh, the whole, I think, probably six months, once a week, training at the bottom of the university pool, you know, watching plasters floating around and, and trying to rescue each other and stuff like that. So that element of it wasn't that amazing until we had a camping trip for two weeks over the summer and we went and camped in Pembrokeshire in the shadow of uh, Scomer Island. And that was amazing. I put my head underwater in the sea for the first time and took a breath underwater in just in, in, in Martin's Haven there. And I was in six meters of water, surrounded by seaweed, swimming around with fish and seaweed. And I thought this was the best thing I have ever, ever done. It was just the coolest thing that I could breathe underwater and, and stay underwater for longer than a breath hold. Um, and I remember, you know, seeing huge, great big spider crabs sort of marauding around and just marveling at this whole experience of being underwater. It was just amazing. So I just it was the best thing. And uh, yeah, so I that was my introduction was sort of diving in this country, and falling in love with the marine wildlife in this country and just literally coming out of every dive, wanting to go straight back in again. Like, what else can I see? It was just absolutely addictive. And then through the diving club. Had the opportunity of going to the Red Sea a couple of times. Again, utterly amazing camping by the Red Sea. Um, getting up first thing in the morning, you'd dive, then you'd have breakfast, then you'd dive again, you'd have lunch, you'd dive again, you'd have dinner, you'd dive again, and then go to bed. So we'd often do four dives a day, and it was relentless, but I couldn't get enough. It was completely addicted. This, I don't know, maybe I was a mermaid, mermaid in, a, in a former life or something like that, but I just, I love being in water. I love swimming. I love that, but but swimming underwater where you've just got this you know this weightlessness this you can move in in any direction it, it's it's absolutely amazing and then of course the life that you see is just phenomenal you know swimming with manta rays in the Maldives uh you know it, when the, when one of those things goes overhead it's like the you know the sky darkens they're absolutely vast um, I don't know, swimming with blue sharks here in the UK, um, swimming with grey seals, um, it, with, with, with dolphins. It's amazing. It never ceases to uh, excite me. And I, I never get out of a, out of a dive going, oh, that wasn't very good, was it? You know, I've always had, there's always been something, you know, you might have very poor visibility and, but you've always seen something or done something that was was amazing that you've not done before so as a result the kids both dive my husband dives you know we're off diving in north wales in a couple of weeks time you know this diving is just part of our family really and i absolutely love it and i anybody 
listening has not tried it he thinks oh I'd, yeah maybe i'd like to you can do it in the uk you can learn right on your doorstep just in, you know around bristol there are diving clubs here um it might not be quite as glamorous as learning in the bahamas or the caribbean or whatever but it's you know it is still amazing and um an eye opening and i think we learn we know so little about our marine wildlife and about what happens at the bottom of the sea you know life on land is so well documented documented and yeah you put your head underwater and so often I see stuff I've not seen before some behavior or a different species that I've not clocked before and you know that's that's very very exciting. Miranda away from your television work you've worked in radio you've written articles for Diver magazine and involved in charity work public speaking as well is there a particular medium you most enjoy working in? And if so, for what reason? Well, I can tell you what I find really hard. So I do find writing really, really hard. I was never that good at English at school. Um, I write because I want to share my experiences. So, you know, if I've been somewhere amazing and dived, uh, you know, an exciting shipwreck or had a, an encounter with a particular species that I want to share, I feel I want to write it down. Uh, I have to do it through um, like an old fashioned dictaphone, like, you know, voice memo. That's the way I do it. I find it really hard putting pen to paper. So I have to talk it in and then listen to it back and then write what I've what I've said. Uh, so the writing side of things is, yeah, I find that really challenging. I have written a few books, um, but I find that really, really difficult. It's not it's not somewhere where I feel really happy at all. Um, radio, I really, really love doing radio. But again, it's a massive challenge. Um, so uh, if you're talking about something that you're really passionate about, then anything's easy. But with radio, obviously, you don't have the visuals. So if you're describing um, a habitat or a creature, you have to be really specific about the words that you use. Um, and I think because I've I've sort of grown and, and had basically most of my experience in telly, I'm very reliant on people seeing what I'm talking about. So I'm not particularly good at uh, closing my eyes and describing, you know, what a puffin looks like, for example. Um, I sort of want to describe my feelings and my emotion about the puffin, maybe what it's doing, but I'm not very good at describing that particular animal. So I, I have to work quite hard with radio. I love it. And it gives you much more freedom than telly as well. When you're on a radio interview, you just arrive and the moment you get out of the car, you start recording. So uh, it is really genuine uh, when you're meeting somebody for the first time. Say you're walking across a, I don't know, a heathland looking for an adder or something like that. You'll you'll st you'll start recording right from the beginning of, of that journey. Whereas with telly, there's you meet the contributor, you set up all the stuff and the you know the lights and the reflector and the camera and the sound and all this that and the other. So it's it's very engineered. Whereas radio is much more immediate and and um, much more accessible. I think really. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, so I would like to do more radio, but I find it difficult. But you know that doesn't that shouldn't stop me, should it? You're many years in broadcast, and you've covered many stories across many mediums, television and radio about environmental issues, travel, um, wreck diving, fine foods, local history, marine con conservation and more. Are there any specific stories you've covered that have made a strong impact? Um, for what reasons? Yeah, so, I mean... It's lovely going to far flung places and experiencing, you know, oh, there's a koala, there's a whale shark, you know, isn't it lovely? Aren't I having a lovely time? Oh, here's some nice food, you know, oh, here's an interesting person. That's great. It's really nice for me. That's the sort of job that I like, you know, uh, great experiences. It's like, you know, travel, but fun. Um, and but actually the, the 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 stories that I've done that have made the most impact that have changed something or made people think about something you know those are the ones that I've really enjoyed doing so for example we did something for the one show on ghost netting now at that time nobody had heard of ghost netting so this is many many years ago and um and ghost fishing as well so this is basically the concept of when fishing line and, and net is thrown into the water to catch fish some of it breaks inevitably you know there's a storm or something doesn't doesn't work so there are 
hundreds, thousands, probably tens of thousands of uh, kilometers of fishing line and nets that are sitting in our oceans that carry on fishing. So, uh, you know, a huge, you can imagine a huge bit of net that becomes ripped or torn or something like that. It still carries on catching fish, but no fisherman's going to come back and, and retrieve that. So inside there are fish that get caught and they die and other fish are coming in and, and maybe seals and dolphins and things like that. And, and so it, and it's absolutely tragic that this happens. Um, and so we actually, there was a, a huge piece of net that was found off the Lizard Peninsula down in Cornwall. And we launched this big sort of expedition to try and retrieve it. And we got all the big guns in and the heavy machinery and stuff like that. And we actually pulled this thing out of the ocean. Um, but before then, people just, you know, normal members of the general public had not really come across that that idea and that concept and that story. And I got so much feedback about that and did lots of interviews about it afterwards. And so it's when you do something like that, that has a real impact, it changes people's mindset and it just, I hate to use the words educates people, but it just makes people think a little bit differently about certain things. So, I mean, I've done lots and lots of story, particularly for the one show of quite gritty stories about raptor persecution, about badger baiting. Um, you know, they're not particularly uh, sort of, fluffy side of of wildlife um and i find those the most rewarding stories to do where you're actually bringing a real issue into people's sitting rooms and making people realize what's going on and hopefully changing their behavior so maybe you know i can i don't know can i um you know buy a particular product that hasn't got some you know palm oil in it or whatever not that i've done anything on palm oil but um you know is there, is there some decision i can take in my life to uh, make sure that that doesn't happen again, that particular issue, problem, whatever. So those are the sort of things. Um, and giving, giving people ideas about what they can do to help wildlife in their garden, you know, really simple stuff like just, you know, bird feeders and leaving water out for, for birds and uh, having a little scruffy area of your garden, which is good, really good for insects, which is then great for bird food and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's stories like that, which are meaningful and uh, hopefully uh, making people think a little bit more that I really, really enjoy doing. Now let's turn the clock back five years from the current time back to 2018, where you were listed as one of the top 100 most influential women in the West. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what are your feelings about being named in this list? And since working in conservation broadcasting, have you seen any major changes and are more women now working in this particular area? So, yeah, I mean, that was an amazing honour. I was really, really uh, completely flabbergasted to, to be nominated for that. It was really lovely. Um, so I think that's probably in connection with the fact that I, uh, for nine years, I was president of the RSPB. Um, so uh, I suppose my name was just it was sort of noticed maybe a little bit more because of the association with that uh, organization. Um, but hopefully I did quite a lot of work with Bristol Green Capital. So in 2015, where we were Bristol Green Capital, I did quite a lot of sort of ambassadorial things, um, which was really, really great fun. Um, so yeah, so that was a real honor. Um, and it's always amazing meeting other incredibly inspirational women. Um, I think, so traditionally, my industry, and it's not this way at all now, but the the if I go back to when I started in the media and particularly natural history, it was very male dominated. You looked at the positions of responsibility and the role models within the industry, and they were all pretty well, most of them were male, not all of them. Um, it was a quite a, it was very tough to get anywhere near the top as a woman. I say that has really changed now. I think attitudes have changed. It's just much um there's there's no gender difference i think in in uh employment really um and there but are there also you know it's it's also a very hard industry to be in if you've got children because particularly with a natural history you are away a lot filming i found it really really difficult when my children were young um i was away a huge amount and i sometimes i could bring the kids with me with either with my husband or my mom or my au pair but we had to have an au pair at home because my husband worked and if i was working i'd often be working away very few uh filming trips are ever close enough um that i'm not staying overnight 
Um, and often I'd be away for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, so that's incredibly demanding. So if you are a, you know, if you are a mum, it's a really tricky industry to, to be in and sustain your career in without trying to find a job share. Say so things are changing, um, but it's still, it's that's the reality of it. Nobody can change that. You know, if you have to, if you want to go and fill the polar, polar bear, you have to go to the Arctic for two, three, four weeks. There's no other way of doing it. So um, it was tricky and challenging, but um, I was very lucky. I had lots of support at home from my husband and my family. And um, so just made that work somehow with the kids. And um, and actually, as a result of it, I've had some amazing opportunities with the family. The children have got involved in an awful lot of what I've done. Um, and it's given them, hopefully, some inspiration of the people that they've met and, and some of the places they've been as well. So... All in all, it worked out, but it was has been quite quite a quite a difficult journey in places. Interestingly, we come on to family life because you married your husband in Nicholas in 1998, and you have a, a son and a daughter. Uh, what area of work does your husband work in, and how does he and your children look at your career, and also the the many guises that we've spoken about that you've been a broadcaster, public speaker, you've written books, you've done so much. How do they see that in from their perspective? So, yeah, I mean, I definitely couldn't have done this alone. Um, it was really important having the support of my husband, especially early on in my career. Going back to those times when I was working for Fox TV, I, it, after I got that initial contract and that summer of amazing work, I then had a period where I was completely out of work because I'd signed this exclusive deal with them and therefore I couldn't work as a presenter. I could have gone back and done other things, which I did in the end, but it was a really challenging time. And had I not had financial and emotional support, I think I would have really, really struggled then. Um, so he's just been there picking up the pieces all the time and when I gallivant off and leave the children he's at home you know sort of you know feeding changing nappies doing all that sort of thing so couldn't have done it without him um I think it was interesting for the kids probably growing up uh, because when they were young I was doing a lot of work on coast and so you know we'd have Alice Roberts round because she only lives around the around the corner and you know we'd go to things and um Neil Oliver would be around or we'd you know we and we went to lots of events and people like Mike Dilger and Nick Baker and Michaela Strachan and Chris Packham would be there and the kids just sort of thought these people were our friends you know this is doesn't everybody have all these famous people around you so it was a bit a bit normal for them really the, the world of telly and I used to try and bring them into the studio as much when I was doing live stuff for the one show I'd bring them in my daughter would have her hair done you know, when I was having my hair and makeup done you know to sort of give them a bit of a sense of you know the background workings of telly you know when we, I did pointless celebrities and I've done ready steady cook and things like that and you bring the kids along let them see let them be in the audience of the show and you know see how all that that happened so they had a great insight into how it all works so it's been all pretty normal for them really um I think it's a bit it's now a bit cringy they're both teenagers and it's like oh god mom are you coming into school to talk oh no please don't do I have to be there it's like okay well you know, I'll try and speak to a different year group, not your year group. Um, so now I'm probably an embarrassment rather than an, an asset. But that's just it's the normal parenting, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure you find the same. It's just like the kids just groan, don't they? But um, yeah, no, it's been it's it's been a fun journey. And I mean, as a result, also, I think the kids are quite happy to stand up in front of a camera and talk about stuff. So um, Ollie's doing we did Big Garden Bird Watch for the RSPB last January. He did an interview for News Round. He did some work diving in Pembrokeshire last year for Sky News Kids. He's really happy standing up in front of a camera and telling it like it is. And so I think, well, maybe if I can pass the baton down another generation and give him an opportunity to talk about his love of nature and conservation and his experiences, then, you know, that's great. We've got another good communicator and somebody who will hopefully inspire you know, another generation of, of wildlife lovers. We shortly come on to that moment, the moment where we ask guests the same uh, quick fire questions to find out maybe things we've not established in the, the last 60 minutes. But before we do so, Miranda, I wanted to ask you outside of your day to day work, what are your interests and, and hobbies? And do you have any long term career plans? And 
are there any creative areas you'd like to explore and maybe pursue later on in or at some stage in your career? Yeah, so, um, gosh, lots to think about there. Uh, so, yeah, outside interests and hobbies, uh, very, very interested in conservation um, and uh, want to do a lot more in, in that. Just being outdoors. I love being outdoors. So whether I'm paddle boarding, whether I'm wild swimming, whether I'm horse riding, um, being active and being outdoors is, is the major part of what I do when I'm not doing telly and writing. Um, and career-wise... I just I want to do more sort of engagement um so more more talks more visits to schools more workshops with kids um more um just sharing my love of the of, of the environment and different habitats and, and and wildlife and making it really relevant to people so you know how does that fit into their world of iPhones and technology and things like that um so finding different ways of doing that um so whether that is more broadcasting or whether that's more I think it's more personal stuff actually so just coming in and talking to local groups um say schools um and finding different ways of engaging people that's sort of what I want to do a bit more of really and practical conservation you know as I have more time as I'm, I'm getting older and, and doing less telly uh, actually just more time you know in our local park planting wildflowers with the you know with the Long Ashton <laughs> uh conservation group doing more stuff like that so you know it's all very exciting going and doing something on the other side of the world but actually this is the the area that i live in this is where I, my home is and actually what can i do to make long ashton and bristol uh better places for wildlife and in, and bring more people in raise awareness of what we've got here in this amazing village we've got fantastic countryside around us um you know, just make people more aware of what we've got and how they can benefit from it. So there'll be a lot more of that in the future. And lastly, interestingly, at the beginning of a conversation, we discovered this love and fascination for filmmaking. And that's pretty much served your passion for broadcasting and producing content about conservation and wildlife and, and so forth. Filmmaking can take many different forms. Have you ever wanted to maybe delve into documentary filmmaking or fictional filmmaking or short filmmaking just do something maybe completely different at some stage the answer to that question should be yes but it's not really I just um I love th the way my career has, has gone I love finding really interesting stories about unusual wildlife and bringing those to a, a, an audience and finding really interesting people as well I find as you get older people get more interesting um so I might do a bit more of that actually talk you know find stories about the people behind the wildlife a little bit more um but not necessarily I just sort of I love what I do I and this is what I I do well um and you know there are plenty of other people going off and making amazing documentaries fiction fictional films definitely would not be my thing at all I'm a very factual person um so when you know when I read I tend to read fact not fiction um when I you know some of the films that I like are um often based on a true story um and that's just I don't know it's my scientific brain um at work I think so yeah I agree with you I think the real life or people's lives are far more fascinating than a fictitious story. Uh, yeah, it can be a lot more interesting. That aside, we come on to that moment, Miranda. This We've hit the century. We're, we're not out. I think your guest number, incredibly, guest number 115. Oh, my God, all, you. <laughs> all, all 115 guests have, asked the, have answered these same questions. Are you ready for this? You don't need to think about these in any detail. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. First of all, number one, what would you say is your favourite pastime? Uh, well, at the moment, it's horse riding. So, in fact, I've just come, just before this interview, I've come from a riding lesson, which is my uh, adrenaline-filled hour on a Tuesday morning, which is just uh, absolutely lovely. And I forget everything, uh, all my worries, all my stress, uh, and I just focus on me horse jumping absolutely brilliant so so exhilarating love it from horses to filmmaking and filmmaking's 
been a, a key subject in today's interview. But what would you say is your favourite film and for what reason? So this is impossible. It's like you're going to ask me about my favourite piece of music now, you know, next. I mean, it's just like, so if you asked me last week, it'd probably be a different answer to, you know, I was thinking about all my favourite films, which a lot of them are really the, the classics like The Shawshank Redemption and The Usual Suspects. And, and then the things like, you know, I love The Croods. I think that's a brilliant animation. I just laugh every time. I love Paul. I think that's the funniest film. I've watched it so many times. So, but today my favourite film is going to be Moulin Rouge um, with Ewan McGregor and, and Nicole Kidman. And I just, it's one of those films I can watch again and again and again and again. It's probably because the music's so powerful rather than necessarily the storyline. But I just love, I love, I remember seeing it for the first time and being shocked and surprised and, terrified and exhilarated and it just it it struck so many dis different emotions in me um and so yeah I'm gonna go for that one <laughs> again we've spoken a bit about writing and you said it's something that maybe doesn't come particularly naturally to you but if you had to cite a favorite novelist who would you choose Again, it's impossible. Um, so I read a lot of novels when I was younger. So, you know, I love um, novelists like Ian McEwan, um, but I don't read novels anymore, really. Um, I, I, I get sent a lot of books. I, a, a lot of people send me books and they're all factual, scientific -y sort of thing. I'm reading a really interesting one all about cetacean, as in whale and dolphin communication. Um, called How to Speak Whale. But so so I really, my my reading time is so valuable and I just don't use it to read novels. So I, I just go for things that are factual. Uh, so people I know or subjects that I'm really interested in learning more about, um, whether it's animal behavior or um, I don't know, or, or, you know, more wildlife stuff. I can never read enough about wildlife. But um, so novelists, I'll say I'll say Ian McEwan, because that's if, if I was 25, that's what I would have answered. But it's a bit of a tame answer, isn't it, really? From writers to professions, if you could have chosen a different profession, what do you think it would have been? So I think it would, you know, along a similar lines to what uh, I started doing was to be a sort of warden or a ranger so where I started off at Slimbridge working with the wardens there um, you know whether that would be I don't know uh, you know working in a beautiful woodland uh, managing that uh, sustainably or whether it would be working in some sort of um, safari park or something like that but it would need to be outdoors 100% of the time I hate being inside um, and it would need to be working with animals and I would need to be working with people. So there aren't many jobs that tick all of those boxes. But, you know, I'd love to if I ever got the opportunity to go and work in, on an island like Skoma or Lundy or somewhere like that. And I could just go and spend a couple of years, you know, surveying birds and chatting to people about puffins and kitty wakes and Manx waters. I would be so happy. So maybe, maybe, who knows in the future, I'll, I'll end up doing something like that. But. Yeah, I have to be outdoors. Music's obviously been a, a strong, um, you know, a strong passion of yours. Have you ever been tempted to be a professional classical musician? Yeah, in fact, I was when I was 16. I remember uh, uh, vividly and one of those turning point conversations with my piano teacher. I really, really, really wanted to be a professional flautist. And she just said, very wise words. She said, right, how many professional flautists could you name? And I said, well, I can probably about 10, maybe. And she said, OK, so how many people internationally do you think want to be professional flautists every year? And you can name 10. Uh, and I was like, oh, OK, so it's a numbers game, really. And she was like, you know, you're very good at music, but you're also quite good academically. So why don't you go and do an academic subject at university, but make sure you throw yourself into all the music that you can, which is exactly what I did here at Bristol. And, and I was lucky that I had the opportunities to do that. Um, so I, I felt like at, at a point, at, at a point, certain points, I felt like I was almost doing two degrees because I was doing so many hours of music. But so there definitely was a was a point where I thought I was going to do this, but I but knowing, but I have fr friends who are professional musicians, and I think it's really, really tough. Um, you know, so much of the time you're doing, you're you're playing and performing music that you might not want to be doing because it's going to pay the bills, or um, you know, you don't have maybe as much choice as you as you want to. And so, for me, I'm lucky enough that music is something I do for pleasure. 
every time I do it, I'm doing it for pleasure. Whether I'm singing in a choir, playing in an orchestra, listening to music, it's all about pleasure. I don't feel ever that I have to, I'm forced to do it because I have to do it to earn money. And that is the joy. So any amateur musician would tell you the same thing as well. I'm really lucky. Um, so yeah, I think that was a little whim at the age of 16, but I'm really glad that I didn't pursue that as a career. It would not have been, not have gone well. You've mentioned so many influential people in your life, whether it be in education, in broadcasting, or people that have shown you the ropes in filmmaking. But if you had to name the greatest inspiration in your life, who would you choose? Oh, it's so impossible because, you know, at every stage of my life, there have been different people who've inspired me. Um, it would be really cheesy to say David Attenborough, but probably, you know, a lot of it started from somebody like him. I mean, my dad making sure that every time David Attenborough was on telly, I'd be sitting in front of the telly watching, you know, the natural world programs and his amazing life on earth and trials of life and things like that. So, um, so I suppose, you know, if I had to pick one, it might be him, but I have only met him a couple of times. So he's inspired me from a distance whether, you know, there are people who I've worked with and um, who've inspired me on a more practical basis um, and people like my tutor at university and some of the amazing camera people and directors that I've worked with. So it's it's just impossible to, to actually highlight one person when actually life's in a massive network of different threads and you have so many influences from different places and some that you're not even aware of half the time so yeah very hard to pinpoint a single person inspirations now to newspapers do you read a newspaper and if so which is your newspaper of choice so I don't read a newspaper. I get most of my news online from the BBC, um, but we do get the week. Uh, we used to get the week junior when the kids were younger as well. I think it's amazing. I love it. It's my, on a Saturday morning, uh, my sort of little hour of heaven is just sitting there with a cup of tea and my breakfast and copy of the week. And I just feel like I can assimilate all the news that's gone on uh, during the week. And there's a lot of comment and um, it's not just news. There's 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 all sorts of stuff in there as well that you wouldn't get from reading news. So I get all my headline stuff from listening to the radio and, um, you know, regularly checking BBC News sort of internationally, nationally and locally as well. Um, but I think I get sort of the the comment and um, sort of reviews and uh, a bit more of in depth uh, understanding of what's going on from from the week. So, and I, it was one of those things I'd recommend anybody to get. It's absolutely brilliant. It's just worth its weight in gold, and the whole family read it as well. Um, sometimes we have a bit of a battle over who's going to get the copy because the kids read it as well, which is fantastic. So it's really accessible. From the daily headlines now to your favourite food, what would you choose as a favourite food? So um, my husband and I are real foodies. We love our food. And whenever we travel, we try and embrace the, as much of the local food and culture as we possibly can. We once had a conversation. It's like if you had 24 hours to live, where would you go and what would you eat? So I think this is where my favourite food would come from. So I would fly to Nice. And just outside Nice, there's a little... Uh, French restaurant there that serves the most amazing uh, fish stew, the bouillabaisse. Um, so I would have that and they serve it with little little pieces of um, uh, sort of toasted bread, which you grate a garlic clove on. And then you put a lump of riz on there and some uh, grated Gruyere cheese. And then you float that in your fish stew, which has got all bits and pieces of wonderful fresh fish. And it is the most divine tasting thing ever. It's a it's a peasant dish, but it's it's just for me, it touches all my taste buds. It's it's sort of slightly spicy. I love fish and seafood, um, crunchy, creamy, just amazing. So that would be my, you know, if I, yeah, if I was diagnosed with some terminal disease, that's what I would do. That would be the last meal that I would eat. So I think that's probably my favourite. From the last meal you'd eat to cultural icons, we ask all our guests to choose one. It could be an important figure in history. It could be somebody a key role in conservation, a religious leader, who would you cite as your favourite cultural? Oh, again, I was thinking about this and uh, how do you pick one person though? It's just really 
it's really hard to think, you know, again, if you'd ask, you know, you ask somebody one week and you think, okay, it's maybe it's Martin Luther King or maybe it's Picasso or maybe it's Freddie Mercury. And I thought and thought and thought, you know, I did come, I, I have managed to, you know, I did manage to get you a favorite film. I will get you a favorite artist and, and album. But I did, as far as cultural icons concerned, I, I really can't, because there are so many different aspects of my life. You know, I love art. I love music. I love wildlife. Um, I love the outdoors and um, I can't I can't pinpoint one person. So I'm going to I'm going to bail out on that one. Um, I'd, be, I'd be the same. I, I couldn't choose just can't one. Do it. Just I, can't do it. I, same with films. I'd have to choose about 50, I think. Yeah. Um, we go from cultural icons to favourite curse words. What is your favourite curse word and why? <laughs> people this because you know we meant to swear but so um I just think dick really somebody's a complete dick that's just it just sums everything up it's the way you say the word that the sort of the the, the punchy beginning of the word it's short sweet and to the point isn't it so yeah Surprise, surprisingly you're the first person to choose it and it's a very good choice <laughs> um what would you say next is your favorite place or holiday destination so um, the most amazing trip we've ever had as a family and the most memorable place and the place that I would 100 percent if somebody said you can live anywhere in the world or you can go on holiday to anywhere in the world without a doubt would be New Zealand. Uh, I loved so much about that whole uh, country. I loved I mean, the wildlife's amazing and, and there are vast, vast areas, completely untouched uh, wildlife and habitat. Um, the people were amazing. They're really chill. They're really laid back. Their whole attitude towards health and safety with young children on boats or doing slightly hazardous activities was just really refreshing. Um, and I just think, yeah, the place is beautiful. The people are beautiful. Um, and there was not particular area, whether it was North Island or South Island. I don't know. I loved all of it. It was just beautiful. And the wine is awesome as well. So, uh, so New Zealand. Uh, probably the south south of South Island New Zealand is pretty special uh, but that was that's just if I could retire somewhere abroad tomorrow with no strings attached and no difficulty I would get on a plane and go there it's beautiful we come back to music again and you're going to curse me for asking you who is your favorite music artist or shall I say your favorites and do you have an all-time favorite album I do have an all-time favourite artist. So um, I love Sting. I, I, he's And I did sit next to him on the one show sofa once. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's like I completely idolised him. I was completely lost for words. I was tongue-tied. I was like, oh, my God, of all the people I could sit next to, he was just, yeah. So I, and right from the early days of the police, uh, yeah, I grew up in the 80s, the most amazing 80s music, um, and loved the police. And then when he went solo, just followed his career and loved all the different uh areas that he's moved into lots of big jazz influences I loved all the stuff he did with Northumbrian Pipes um and all these collaborations with different artists um I also love the fact that he he steps out of the box quite a lot and instead of just doing pieces in 4-4 and just sort of standard time he'll do he'll throw in something in 5-8 or 7-8 or something like that and it really sort of throws you when you're listening to it but it's really cool and so, yeah, love, love Sting. Uh, heard him live a few times. And uh, so, yeah, he is, that's easy, actually, that one. Um, uh, album, you're going to ask me next, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask a, a favourite album, maybe from a yeah. particular period or time yeah, in your that's, life. That's harder because, um, again, it's like, oh, my God, those, you know, those 80s albums like Joshua Tree and, you know, Queen and, thriller and stuff like that it's just so iconic but I think if there's one album if I had to do like a Desert Island Discs album it would be Dire Straits Brothers in Arms because I just I could listen to that a million times and still not get bored of it I just yeah it's amazing love Dire Straits uh so yeah that's that I, one. I smiled when you mentioned Dire Straits because I'm a, a bit of a fan and I was talking to someone about the Straits the other day and the album that does it for me I love Love Over Gold, the short epic album. Yeah. yeah, yeah. with Telegraph Road. Oh, yeah. which is amazing. And yeah, because you think then you think of all the songs that aren't on Brothers in Arms, like Sultans of Swing. And you think, oh yeah, should I have fixed? But anyway, but I think as a as a as a as a complete album in itself, I still think that one, yeah, that sort of works best for me. Sting's an interesting choice as well. And I 
I feel as somebody who loves as a, a hobby to write songs, I kind of feel that Sting is a little bit forgotten as a songwriter because he, he's an incredible pop songwriter. And I, I still think Every Breath You Take is probably the most perfect pop record that anyone mm. could could write. It is just, it yeah. just tick, ticks every box. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, stunning. Yeah. Okay, the last two. What would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Um, so so achievement is a really hard thing, isn't it? Because have you have you won something? Have you um uh I don't know, you know, have you saved a species? Have you, you know, it's such a hard thing to quantify what an achievement is. I suppose the most the most obvious thing is is winning a BAFTA for Coast. Um, I mean that's and if I look back, it's like, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Holding the BAFTA award like that. Um, I think so. That's probably the one I'd, I'd have to choose. Um, it was it was a real honour being president of the RSPB for nine years as well. Um, and so uh, I don't quite know how I got that position, but thank you <laughs> to whoever uh, asked me. Um, so that that could be another um, sort of tangible achievement um other things are, are you know harder to to sort of quantify aren't they really but i think that's yeah so probably the the bafta uh miranda christianikoff the Christianikov. you're nearly there there's another syllable in the middle <laughs> trust trust me to get it wrong right, okay. um right at the end as well i thought it was doing all right until that point um <laughs> and, and finally um the last question how do you wish to be remembered so and again, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? So um, that I that I made a difference along the way. So something, you know, I've I've uh, either I've made a difference in somebody's life, like you know, I've been to school and talked to some kids, and one of them's become a marine biologist because they heard me speak. That sounds a bit big headed, but you know, occasionally people write to me and said, "Oh, I've you know done this because of you," and you're like, "Oh, wow, that's incredible." Um, so a difference to either somebody's life or to to something in 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 the wildlife world so i've i've helped in the conservation of a particular habitat or i don't think in a particular species i don't think my my skill set is that focused but um that i've made a difference to somebody or something somewhere it's a bit vague isn't it but you, you know again you, you know there are so many things in life that that i could think about and i could i could talk about here so um yeah yeah somebody probably somebody has said yeah because I I heard or read something you wrote or saw you on tv you know there was an inspiration to go and do something um that's really really rewarding the first time I got a letter from somebody said I've taken up scuba diving because I saw you diving and you're the first sort of you know woman I've seen do doing it in the UK you think oh my god just I've yeah my life's worthwhile now it doesn't nothing else really matters because I've inspired somebody um so and so hopefully there's there's a few people out there that I've I've helped inspire um and maybe change the course of their life slightly just as as I've had done for me by so many incredible people in my life I'd imagine you'll inspire many more and to use a television term that is a cut <laughs> that you'll probably be glad to know is the end of the the interview and the final set of questions but thanks for sharing your story and I should say more importantly your journey the narrative how it how it's begun and how we've got to the current time in your your life in your career thanks for being so humble so nice and and honest and I think the thing that shone through the most for me is your passion for what you do and you love what you you do, and that's come across very vibrantly for like the the last sixty minutes. So, thank you for talking about how it all began, and also the other areas or the other areas you worked in outside of broadcasting. Your love of music, for example. So, thank you kindly. And are there any future projects? And how do we find out more about you? And well, <laughs> see, see see more or any more programs. In, in the works at the at the moment 
Yeah, so um, I'm not doing any big projects for broadcast at the moment. Um, I'm sort of concentrating on smaller things and, and I sort of hinted things are closer to home, really, that mean an awful lot to me. Uh, so I'm doing some filming for British Canoeing, um, all about clean waters and access to water, um, which will be out in time for the summer holidays, which would be brilliant. Um, and uh, I'm doing a couple of cruises. So I'm talking on uh, about my passion for British wildlife on a on a UK cruise in a few weeks time, uh, which will be amazing. Um, so I think those one to one things are becoming more important to me. So speaking to a smaller number of people rather than broadcasting and speaking to millions, actually doing more narrow casting and, and having a more targeted sort of message to, to fewer people. Um, there's stuff on my website about what I'm doing. Um, I'm not very, very active on social media, but um, uh, so I don't really, I don't tend to broadcast all the little bits and pieces that I'm doing because a lot of them are quite personal, but um, I'm always busy. There's always another project in the pipeline. Um, so yeah, watch this space really. Well, watch the space and thanks again. Thanks for taking part in the interview and I wish you the, the very best with um, your future endeavours. Thank Brilliant. you. See you in the shop. <laughs>